Good morning, everyone. Today we're talking about genetics, the introduction. Make sure you check Schoology for any work that you may be seeing that you need to do. Today, if you haven't already, complete the genetics pre-quiz on page one of your genetics packet, which will be available for pickup um, soon in your pickup folder. Complete the genetics pre-quiz, the questions about genetics. What do you already know? Let's check it out. Genetics helps us understand the biological programming behind all life forms. But what exactly is the science of genetics? And what does its future hold? Genetics is the study of heredity, the expression of traits and how they are passed from generation to generation. For thousands of years, humans have observed this inheritance of traits and implemented their knowledge to breed and domesticate plants and animals. However, the science behind inheritance was only starting to be understood in the mid-19th century. Around 1865, Austrian monk and botanist Gregor Mendel published the results of his hybridization studies of pea plants. In his findings, he noted the role of factors that influence the expression of traits. These factors later became known as genes. Each human has between 20,000 and 25,000 genes. This collection, called a genome, determines a person's traits by influencing factors on a cellular level. Genetic information is stored in every cell's nucleus. Structures called chromosomes carry this information in the form of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. DNA is a double helix of nucleotides, chemical compounds composed of sugar and phosphate molecules, along with the bases thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. These segments of DNA are what we call genes, and it is within those genes that chemical compounds provide the coding for all information about a person's inherited traits. Human cells contain so much DNA to carry this large amount of information that, if unraveled, the DNA in each cell would be over six feet long. At the turn of the 21st century, an international effort to decode human DNA was launched. Called the Human Genome Project, it ended up identifying about 99% of the entire human genetic sequence. A revolution in medical science whose implications far surpass even the discovery of antibiotics. Discoveries in genetics research have unearthed tremendous opportunities in medicine, such as genetic testing and the manipulation of genes. But with these opportunities come risks and ethical questions. And finding the answers to those questions may be the next stage of our understanding of genetics. About the amazing power of genetics. All right, guys, locate your genetics notes so we can get deep into the, top, the weeds of genetics. As you can see, some of the notes are on the board now. Pause if you need to and make sure you complete your notes. Genetics is the study of genes, DNA, and traits. Heredity is a special word that means how are traits passed down through generations, from parents to children. The DNA molecule contains the information needed to create life, often called the blueprint for life. So what is DNA made of? If you look at DNA, its structure is a spiral, kind of like a staircase, made of two strands of a special sugar called deoxyribose, and four types of nucleic acids. And that's where we get the name deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA for short. 
the nucleic acids make what we would call the stairs or the steps in our twisted ladder. They're often called base pairs because they pair one to another. In our model, we see the yellow pairing with green and the red pairing with the orange. Let's take a closer look at the base pairs. There's four choices, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. What makes these so important is that the order of the base pairs is what determines the protein that is created by that DNA code or gene. Simply changing the order of the base pairs could change the nature of the gene. A simple example could be um, changing the color of someone's hair or eyes. DNA code. In our code, the adenine, referred to as A, binds with the thymine, or T for short. Guanine binds with cytosine, or C. A convenient way for you guys to remember this is at gates chyli, A bonds with T, G with C. So complete the left side of your DNA structure. We've unwound the spiral so that we can see a little better. And we're going to write on our, our steps the name of a pair. Here's a gene that I've created that starts with A, G, T, T, C, and T. Can you find the matching pair? Try it, pause, and come back and see how you did. Okay, G always bonds with C. So we'll find a C on the other side. T bonds with A, C with G, and T with A. Just remember, at gates chi line, and you can't go wrong. DNA is not a straight, ladder, more of a spiral. We call this the double helix. And discovering the actual structure of the double helix was quite an adventure in scientific discovery. It took several years and many different teams of scientists to actually finally figure out what the chemical structure of DNA looks like. Finally, let's conclude today with some key points. Things we just need to know when we talk about genetics. First, genes are the codes that make proteins. And those codes are determined by the order of the A's, T's, C's, and G's in the DNA molecule. So knowing what the DNA molecule looked like and what it was made of was a really important step in understanding what a gene is and how that gene relates to your traits. Two, most of your physical traits are actually caused by many groups of genes. A gene typically from a thousand to tens of thousands of base pairs long, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And most of your traits, like how tall you are, the shape of your nose, the blood vessels that connect your heart to your lungs, those are not caused simply by one gene, but a combination of many, many genes, all working in conjunction. Third, genes always come into pairs, groups of two. This is because you're given one gene from your mother and one gene from your father. And this can help explain why you look a little bit like each of your parents, but not exactly like either one. And finally, often you'll find one gene being dominant and one gene being recessive. And what that means is the dominant gene is the one that's expressed or that you see. Something like brown eyes, for example, it's caused by a dominant gene. Blue eyes requires recessive genes. So if there's one dominant and one recessive, the dominant gene will be the one that appears. However, the recessive gene is still there. It doesn't go away, and it could actually come up in the next generation. But we'll get more into that later. For now, just make sure you know the four key points of genetics. Remove swab from collection receptacle and gently scrape inside of cheek with a spinning motion. I don't know what you 
expect to find out. <laughs> Trust me, you're not a Romanov. Dear Rita and Moby, what does it mean when someone says it's in my genes? From Barbara. Well, you've probably noticed that family members often resemble each other. The similarities can be physical, like hair color, or personality stuff, like a goofy sense of humor. Some of these traits or qualities can be explained by the way we're raised, but other similarities run deeper. They're written into instructions within ourselves, and these instructions are inherited, passed on from parents to children. That's what people mean when they say, it's in my genes. But even before scientists discovered genes, people knew that some traits were inherited. Ancient farmers even found a way to influence the process. Like if they wanted to grow larger fruit, they'd take two plants with the biggest fruit and breed them. Their young, or offspring, would be more likely to have those traits too. Keep breeding plants with the biggest fruit, and the size increases in the whole crop. This practice of choosing which individuals to breed is called artificial selection. Farmers have been improving crops and livestock with it for thousands of years. So it's no surprise that the guy who figured out how it really worked was the son of a farmer. His name was Gregor Mendel, and he chose to study pea plants. They were easy to grow and breed, and had lots of different traits he could observe. In the mid-1800s, he bred thousands of pea plants and recorded their traits. Things like height, pod shape, and flower color. At the time, it was thought that inheritance worked by blending traits from both parents. Like if a white flowering pea bred with a purple one, the offspring would be light purple. But Mendel found that in pea plants, traits didn't mix like paint, they stayed separate. When he bred plants with white and purple flowers, their offspring's flowers weren't light purple. They were either white or purple. The same pattern held for other features he studied. The offspring would have the same trait as one parent, not a mix of both. To Mendel, that meant traits must be passed down in separate units. He called these units factors and believed they were stored in cells. It was a revolutionary idea. Maybe too revolutionary. Other scientists ignored it for decades. Nope, Mendel was definitely onto something. Turns out, Every cell in an organism has the same number of these tiny structures called chromosomes. Except for reproductive cells, they only have half as many. When reproductive cells from two parents fuse to create offspring, two cells become one. But the chromosomes don't fuse. They stay separate from one another. So the offspring ends up with the same number of chromosomes as its parents. It's just like what Mendel described, separate units inherited from each parent. Mendel's factors are what we now know as genes. They're located in chromosomes, and each one carries instructions for a trait. Well, chromosomes are mainly made of a substance called DNA. It holds the secret to genes and to life on Earth. Hidden within DNA's ladder-like structure is a code that cells can read. The rungs of the ladder are made of four different building blocks. You can think of them as letters in a very simple language. String enough of them together, and they can spell out the instructions for building and operating an organism. That's all a gene is, the instructions for a specific trait written in DNA. A lot of the code has to do with making proteins. These molecules are like the construction equipment for life. They can be built to do just about anything, from 
making a plant grow taller to giving its flowers a certain color. Genes control these traits by telling cells how to build different proteins. So those factors that Mendel first imagined are located on strands of DNA, which are bundled into chromosomes, which get passed from parents to their offspring. Well, that's if everything goes right. Every time genes get copied, like when a cell divides in two, there's a chance of mutation. That's a change to DNA's code, kind of like a typo in a set of instructions. Mutations can mess up a gene's instructions for building a protein. Usually it's not a big deal. It's like when you can still make out a misspelled word. But sometimes the mistake changes the meaning of the word. When this kind of mutation happens, cells function differently from how they're supposed to, which can change traits in all kinds of ways. That's usually not good for the organism. A lot of diseases are caused by a genetic error that gets passed down in reproductive cells. Like hemophilia, a dangerous condition that prevents the blood from clotting. But occasionally, a mutation turns out to be beneficial. Like, say a mutation in a fish's DNA gives it better camouflage. It'll be better at hiding from all the predators that want to eat it. And if it survives, it may pass that same trait on to its offspring. This process, called natural selection, is how useful traits spread in nature. But that process can take millions of years. Like I said before, ancient farmers used artificial selection to speed up the process. And today, humans have more control over genes than ever. Scientists can now change DNA by editing its code directly. That could give us the power to cure genetic diseases and to make all kinds of other changes. Well, Mendel's pea plants were easy. A single gene caused a single trait. But the relationship between genes and traits isn't always so straightforward. One trait can be affected by many genes. And one gene can affect many traits. Plus, whatever your genes are, behavioral stuff like nutrition and exercise can affect how things turn out. All of which means it's really hard to predict the effects of editing DNA. We have a lot of thinking to do before we start messing with human genes. Whoa, same day service! Congratulations, you are now the proud owner of your own pair of genetically tailored genes. Wear them in good health. I gotta say, they are flattering. Thanks for joining our lesson today, trying to science. Hope you find out a little bit more about genetics. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.